a presumption. There is another kind of vainglory which is an over-good opinion we form of our own worth. It is an unreasoning affection by which we cherish ourselves, which represents us to ourselves as other than we are. As the passion of love lends beauties and graces to the object it embraces, it makes its victims, with muddled and unsettled judgment, think that what they love is other and more perfect than it is. However, I do not want a man to misjudge himself for fear of erring in that direction, or to think himself less than he is. Judgment must maintain its rights in all matters. It is right that it should see in this subject as elsewhere what truth sets before it. If he is Caesar, let him boldly judge himself the greatest captain in the world. We are nothing but ceremony. Ceremony carries us away, and we leave the substance of things. We hang on to the branches and abandon the trunk and body. We have taught the ladies to blush at the mere mention of what they are not at all afraid to do. We dare not call our members by their right names, and we are not afraid to employ them in every kind of debauchery. Ceremony forbids our expressing in words things that are permissible and natural, and we obey it. Reason forbids our doing things that are illicit and wicked, and no one obeys it. I find myself here entangled in the laws of ceremony, for she does not allow a man either to speak well of himself or to speak ill. We shall let her alone for the moment. Those whom fortune, whether we should call her good or bad, has caused to spread, spend their lives in some eminent station, can testify to what they are by their public actions. But those whom she has employed only in a mass, and of whom no one will speak unless they do so themselves, may be excused if they have the temerity to speak of themselves to those who have an interest in knowing them after the example of Lucilius. He would confide as unto trusted friends, his secrets to his notebooks, turn there still, not elsewhere, whether faring well or ill, so that the old man's whole life lay revealed as on a votive tablet. That man committed to his paper his actions and thoughts, and portrayed himself there as he felt he was, nor did anyone doubt the honesty or disparage the motives of Rutilius or Scaros for doing so. So I remember that from my tenderest childhood, people noticed in me some indefinable carriage of the body and certain gestures testifying to some vain and stupid pride. I want to say this first, that it is not unbecoming to have characteristics and propensities so much our own and so incorporated into us that we have no way of sensing and recognizing them. And of such natural inclinations, the body is likely to retain a certain bent without our knowledge or consent. It was a certain affectation in keeping with his beauty that made Alexander lean his head a little to one side and Alcibiades speak softly and with a lisp. Julius Caesar used to scratch his head with one finger, which is the behavior of a man full of troublesome thoughts, and Cicero, it seems to me, was in the habit of wrinkling his nose, which is a sign of a mocking nature. Such gestures can arise in us unperceived. There are others that are artificial, of which I do not speak like bowels and salutations by which men gain credit most often wrongfully for being very humble and courteous. A man may be humble through vainglory. I am rather prodigal in taking off my hat, especially in summer, and I never receive this salute without returning it from whatever class of man it may come unless he is in my pay. I could wish that princes, certain princes I know, would be more sparing and just in dispensing these salutes, for when they are thus strewn about indiscriminately, they have no more power. If they are given without consideration, they are given without effect. Among the extraordinary mannerisms, let us not forget the arrogance of the Emperor Constantius, who in public always held his head straight without turning or bending it this way or that, and even to look at those who saluted him from the side, keeping his body fixed and motionless without letting himself move with the sway of his coach, without daring either to spit or to blow his nose or to wipe his face in front of people. I do not know whether those gestures that people noticed in me were of the first kind, and whether I really had some occult propensity to this fault, as may well be, and I cannot answer for the movements of my body, but as for the movements of my soul, I want to confess here what I am aware of. 
there are two parts in this vainglory, namely to esteem ourselves too highly and not to esteem others highly enough. As for the first, it seems to me that first of all these considerations should be taken into account, that I feel myself oppressed by an error of my soul which I dislike both as unjust and even more as troublesome. I try to correct it, but uproot it, I cannot. It is that I lower the value of the things I possess because I possess them and raise the value of things when they are foreign and absent and not mine. This humor spreads very far, as the prerogative of authority makes husbands regard their own wives and many fathers their children with wicked disdain. So it is with me, and between two similar works I should always decide against my own. Not so much that zeal for my progress and improvement disturbs my judgment and keeps me from being satisfied with myself, as that dominion of itself breeds contempt of what we hold and control. Far off government's customs and languages delight me, and I realize that Latin by its dignity beguiles me more than it should, as it does with as it does children and common people. The housekeeping, the house, and the horse of my neighbor, if equal in value, seem better than my own, because they are not mine the more so because I am very ignorant of my affairs. I wonder at the assurance and confidence each man has about himself, whereas there is virtually nothing that I know I know, or that I dare give my word I, that I can do. I do not have my means catalogued and arranged, and I know about them only after doing something. I am as doubtful of myself as of anything else, whence it comes about that if I happen to do well in a task, I attribute it more to my luck than to my ability, for I plan them all at random and in fear. Likewise, this is generally true of me, that of all the opinions antiquity has held of man as a whole, the ones I embrace most willingly and adhere to most firmly are those that despise, humiliate, and nullify us most. Philosophy seems to me never to have such an easy game as when she combats our presumption and vanity, when she honestly admits her uncertainty, weakness, and ignorance. It seems to me that the nursing mother of the falsest opinions, public and private, is the overgood opinion man has of himself. These people who perch astride the epic cycle of Mercury, who see so far into the heavens, yank out my teeth. For in the study I am making the subject of which is man, when I find such an extreme variety of judgment, so deep a labyrinth of difficulties, one on top of the other, so much diversity and uncertainty in the very school of wisdom, you may well wonder, since these people have not been able to come to an agreement in the knowledge of themselves and their own state, which is ever present before their eyes, which is in them, since they do not know the motion of what they move themselves or how to depict and decipher to us the springs that they hold and manage themselves, how I should believe them about the cause of the ebb and flow of the river Nile. The curiosity to know things was given to men as a scourge, says the Holy Scripture, but to come to my own particular case, it would be very difficult, it seems to me, for anyone else to esteem himself less, or indeed for anyone else to esteem me less than I esteem myself. I consider myself one of the common sort, except in that I consider myself so guilty of the commoner and humbler fault, but not of faults disavowed or excused, and I value myself only for knowing my value. If there is vainglory in me, it is infused in me superficially by the treachery of my nature, and has no body of its own to appear before my judgment. I am sprinkled with it, but not died. For in truth, as regards any kind of products of the mind, I have never brought forth anything that satisfied me, and the approbation of others does not repay me. My taste is delicate and hard to please, and especially regarding myself, I am incessantly disowning myself, and I feel myself in every part floating and bending with weakness. I have nothing of my own that satisfies my judgment. My sight is clear and controlled enough, but when I put it to work it grows blurred, as I find most evidently in poetry. I love it infinitely. I am a pretty good judge of other men's works, but in truth I play the child when I try to set my hand to it. I cannot endure myself. A man may play the fool anywhere, but not in poetry, for gods and men are booksellers, and booksellers refuse to countenance a mediocre muse. Would God that maxim were written on the front of all our printers' shops to deny entrance to so many versifiers? No man has more assurance than a bad poet. 
Why have we no such nations as these? Dionysius the Elder esteemed nothing of his own so highly as his poetry. At the time of the Olympic Games, with chariots surpassing all others in magnificence, he also sent poets and musicians to present his verses with royally gilded and tapestried tents and pavilions. When they came to deliver his verses, the grace and excellence of the pronunciation at first drew the attention of the people, but when later they came to ponder the ineptitude of the work, they first grew scornful and becoming more and more bitter in their judgment. They presently flew into a fury and ran to all his pavilions and knocked them down and tore them to bits in resentment. And when his chariots did not make any kind of a show in the races either, and the ship bringing his men back missed Sicily and was driven and shattered by the tempest against the coast of Tarentum, the people felt certain that it was the wrath of the gods irritated like themselves against this bad poem. And even the sailors who escaped from the shipwreck seconded this opinion of the people. The oracle that predicted his death also seemed to subscribe to this somewhat. It said that Dionysius would be near his end when he had vanquished men better than himself, which he took to mean the Carthaginians who surpassed him in power. In inviting them, he often sidestepped victory and tempered it so as not to incur the fate predicted. But he misunderstood it, for the god was referring to the time he gained the award at Athens over better tragic poets than he, by favor and injustice, presenting in the competition his play entitled The Linians, which, after which victory he suddenly died, partly of the excessive joy that he got from it. What I find excusable in my own work, I find so not in itself and in reality, but in comparison with other and worse things to which I see people give credit. I am envious of the happiness of those who can rejoice and feel gratified in their work, for it is an easy way to give oneself pleasure, since the source of the pleasure is in oneself, especially so if there is a little firmness in their self-conceit. I know a poet to whom the strong and the weak in the crowd and in the chamber and in heaven and heaven and earth cry out that he does not know his business for all that he will not reduce one bit of the measure for which he has cut himself out he is always beginning again always reconsidering and always persisting all the stronger and more set in his opinion because it depends on him alone to maintain it my works are so far from delighting me that as many times as i sample them again so many times i am vexed with them when i reread, read i blush for I see quite enough fit to erase, though it was I who wrote the stuff. I, always, I have always an idea in my mind and some blurred picture which offers me, as if in a dream, a better form than the one I have employed, but I cannot grasp it and exploit it, and that idea, in it, it's, that idea itself is on only a mediocre plane. From that I conclude that the productions of those great rich minds of the past are very far beyond the utmost stretch of my imagination and desire. Their writings not only satisfy and fill me, but astound me and transfix me with admiration. I judge their beauty, I see it, if not to the utmost, at least enough so that I cannot aspire to it myself. Whatever I undertake, I owe a sacrifice to the graces, as Plutarch says of someone, to curry their favor. If anything gives pleasure that I write, if it affects men's senses with delight, unto the charming graces it is due. They abandon me at every turn. Everything I write is crude. It lacks distinction and beauty. I do not know how to make things appear any more precious than they really are. My fashioning is no help to the matter. That is why I need my matter strong and with plenty of grip and shining by its own light. When I seize on popular and gayer matters, it is so as to go my own way. For I do not love a solemn and gloomy wisdom, as does the world, and to cheer up myself, not my style, which rather prefers grave and austere matters, at least if I should give the name of style to a formless and undisciplined way of talking, a popular jargon, and a way of proceeding without definitions, without divisions, without conclusions, and confused like that of Amaphanius and Rabirius. I do not know how to please or delight or tickle. The best story in the world dries up in my hands and becomes dull. I do not know how to talk except in good earnest and am wholly devoid of that fa facility which I see in several of my acquaintances of entertaining the first com comer and holding the attention of, the whole, of a whole group or tirelessly amusing the ear of a prince with all kinds of talk, matter never failing them, 
because of the gift they have of knowing how to use the first subject that comes to mind, accommodating it to the humor and capacity of the people they are dealing with. Princes are not very fond of serious talk, nor I of telling stories. The first and easiest arguments, which are commonly the best received, I do not know how to use. A bad popular preacher. On all matters, I am apt to say the deepest things I know. Cicero thinks that in philosophical treaties, the hardest part is the exordium. If that is so, I shall stick to the conclusion. Yet we must tune the strings to all sorts of notes, and the sharpest is the one that least often comes into play. There is at least as great perfection in developing an empty theme as in sustaining a weighty one. Sometimes we must handle things superficially, sometimes go into them deeply. I well know that most people keep on that low plane since they grasp things only by that outer bark, but I also know that the greatest masters, both Xenophon and Plato, are often seen relaxing into that humble and popular way of speaking and treating things, sustaining it with the graces that never fail them. As for the rest, my language has no ease or polish, it is harsh and disdainful, with a free and unruly disposition, and I like it that way, if not by judgment, then by inclination. But I am quite conscious that sometimes I let myself go too far, and that in the effort to avoid art and affectation, I fall back into them in another direction. I strive to be concise and grow obscure. Plato says that length and brevity are properties which neither decrease nor increase the worth of style. If I should attempt to follow that other style that is given smooth and orderly, I should not attain it, and even though the concision and cadences of Sullus are more to my humor, yet I consider Caesar both greater and less easy to imitate. And if my inclination leads me more to imitate Seneca's style, I nonetheless esteem Plutarch's more. As in action, so in speech, I simply follow my natural bent, which is perhaps the reason why I can do better in speech than in writing. Movement and action animate words, notably in men who move about briskly, as I do, and become heated. Bearing, countenance, voice, robe, and posture can give value to things which in themselves are nothing but babble. Asala complains in Tacitus of certain tight garments of his time and of the form of the benches where the orders had to speak, which weakened their eloquence. My French is corrupted, both in pronunciation and other respects, by the barbarism of my home soil. I never saw a man from the south of France whose accent was not clearly marked and offending to pure French ears. Yet this is not because I am very, very expert in Paracordian, for I have no more command of it than of German, and that does not worry me much. It is a language like others around me, <clears throat> on one side or another, as those of Poito, Santon, Anguamil, Limoges, and Avernay, soft, drawling, loose bowled. To be sure, there is above us, toward the mountains, a Gascon dialect that I find singularly beautiful, dry, brief, expressive, and indeed a more manly and military language than any that I understand as sinewy, powerful, and pertinent as French, as graceful, delicate, and abundant. As for Latin, which was given me for my mother tongue, I have lost, through lack of practice, the ability to use it quickly in speaking, yes, and in writing, in which they used to call me Master John. That is how little I am worth on that side. Beauty is a great recommendation in dealings with men. It is the prime means of conciliation between them, and there is no man so barbarous and surly as not to be somewhat struck by its charm. The body has a great part in our being. It holds a high rank in it, so its structure and composition are well worth consideration. Those who want to split up our two principal parts and sequester them from each other are wrong. On the contrary, we must couple and join them together. We must order the soul not to draw aside and entertain itself apart, not to scorn and abandon the body, nor can it do so except by some counterfeit monkey trick but to rally to the body, embrace it, cherish it, assist it, control it, advise it, set it right, and bring it back when it goes astray. In short, to marry it and be a husband to it, so that their actions may appear not different and contrary, but harmonious and uniform. Christians are particularly instructed about this bond. 
for they know that divine justice embraces this association and union of body and soul even to making the body capable of eternal rewards and that god watches the whole man in action and wills that he receive in his eternity punishment or reward according to his merits the peripatetic sect of all sects the most sociable attributes to wisdom this sole care to provide and procure the common good of these two associated parts and they show that the other sects for not having devoted themselves enough to the consideration of this mixture have taken sides one for the body another for the soul with equal error and have put aside their subject which is man and their guide which they generally avow as nature the first distinction that existed between men and the first consideration that gave some men preeminence over others was probably the advantage of beauty they portioned out the fields and gave to each after his beauty strength and intellect for them beauty was prized and strength enjoyed respect now i am a little below medium height this is not only an ugly defect but also a disadvantage especially for men in command or office for the authority given by a fine presence and bodily majesty is lacking C. Marius was reluctant to accept soldiers who were not six feet in height. The courtier is quite right to prefer an advantage of height to any other for the gentleman he is training, and to reject any peculiarity that will make people point him out. But as for choosing to have him shorter rather than taller if he fails to be of this medium height, I would not do so for a military man. Little men, says Aristotle, may well be pretty but not handsome, and in greatness is a great soul known as is beauty in a great tall body the ethiopians and indians he says in electing their kings and magistrates considered the beauty and lofty stature of their persons they were right for it breeds respect in his followers and terror in the enemy to see marching at the head of a troop a leader of handsome and majestic stature turnus himself moves with the foremost arms and hand splendid and build a full head taller than his band our great divine and heavenly king whose ever reverie particular should be carefully religiously and reverently noted did not reject the recommendation of a handsome body fairer than the children of men psalms and plato desires beauty as well as temperance and courage in the guardians of his republic it is a great annoyance to be addressed in the midst of your servants with the question where is the master and to get only the tail end of the salute made to your barber or your secretary as happened to poor philopoemen he was the first of his company to arrive at a house where he was expected and his hostess who did not know him and saw his rather unimpressive appearance set him to work helping her maids draw water and stir up the fire in honor of philopoemen the gentleman of his suite having arrived and surprised him busy at the fine occupation for he had not failed to obey the command given him, asked him what he was doing there. I am paying, he answered them, the penalty of my ugliness. The other kinds of beauty are for women. The beauty of stature is the only beauty of men. Where smallness dwells, neither breadth and roundness of forehead, nor clarity and softness of eyes, nor the moderate form of the nose, nor small size of ears and mouth, nor regularity and whiteness of teeth, nor the smooth thickness of a beard, brown as the husk of a chestnut, nor curly hair, nor proper roundness of head, nor freshness of color, nor a pleasant facial expression, nor an orderless body, nor just proportion of limbs can make a handsome man. For the rest, I have a strong, thick-set body, a face not fat but full, a temperament between the jovial and the melancholy, moderately sanguine and warm. My legs are stiff with bristles, my chest with shaggy hair, sound and sprightly health, rarely troubled by illness, until I was well along in years. Such I was, for I am not considering myself at this moment, when I am well on the road to old age, having long since passed forty. Old age shatters their powers, they ripen strength, and melts into decrepitude at length. What I shall be from now on will be nothing but half a being. It will no longer be myself. I escape and steal away from myself every day. The passing years steal from us all things one by one. Adroitness and agility I have never had, and yet I am the son of a very nimble father whose sprightliness lasted him until his extreme old age. He scarcely ever found a man of his condition who was his equal in bodily exercise. 
just as I have scarcely found any who did not surpass me, except in running, in which I was just fair. Of music, either vocal, for which my voice is very inept, or instrumental, that never succeeded in teaching me anything, at dancing, tennis, wrestling, I've never been able to acquire any but very slight ordinary ability, at swimming, fencing, vaulting, and jumping, none at all. My hands are so clumsy that I cannot even write, so I can read it, so that I would rather do over what I have scribbled than give myself the trouble of unscrambling it, and I read hardly any better. I feel that I weigh upon my listeners, otherwise a good scholar. I cannot choose a letter the right way, nor could I ever cut a pen or carve at table worth a wrap, or saddle a horse or properly carry a bird and release it, or talk to dogs, birds, or horses. My bodily qualities, in short, are very well matched with those of my soul. There is no liveliness, there is only a full, ver firm vigor. I stand up well under hard work, but I do so only if I go to it of my own will, and as much as my desire leads me to it. When gently zest beguiles the rigors of the toil, otherwise, if I am not lured to it by some pleasure, and if I have any other guide than my own pure free will, I am good for nothing, for I have come to the point where except for health and life there is nothing for which I am willing to bite my nails, nothing that I am willing to buy at the price of mental torment and constraint. I would not buy at such a fee all Tagus sands and all the gold it rolls to see. Extremely idle, extremely independent, both by nature and by art, I would as soon lend my blood as my pains. I have a soul all its own, accustomed to conducting itself in its own way, having had neither governor nor master forced on me to this day. I have gone just so far as I pleased, and at my own pace. This has made me soft and useless for serving others, and no good to anyone but myself. And for my own sake there was no need to force that heavy, lazy, and do-nothing nature, for having found myself from birth in such a degree of fortune that I had reason to be content with it, and having as much sense as I felt I had occasion for, I have sought nothing, and have also acquired nothing. <clears throat> I am not wafted by fair winds with swelling sails, yet neither do I steer my life through adverse gales. In strength, wit, beauty, virtue, rank, and wealth, I am cast the last among the first, first among the last. The only ability I have needed is the ability to content myself with my lot which, however, if you take it rightly, requires a well-ordered state of mind, equally difficult in every kind of fortune, and which we see by experience is more readily found in want than in abundance, perhaps because, as with our other passions, hunger for riches is sharpened more by the use of them than by the lack of them, and because the virtue of moderation is rarer than that of patience. And all I needed was to enjoy pleasantly the good things that God ha in his liberality has had placed in my hands. I have never tasted of any sort of tedious work. I have had hardly anything to manage but my own affairs, or if I have, it has been on condition of managing them at my own times and in my own way, commissioned by people who trusted me and knew me and did not hustle me. For experts get some service out of even a restive and broken-winded horse. Even my childhood was guided in a mild, free fashion, exempt from rigorous subjection. All this was built up in me, a delicate disposition, unable to endure worry, to such a point that I like to have the losses and disorders that concern me hidden from me. I put under the heading of expenses what my nonchalance cost me for his food and upkeep, things that the master never perceives superfluous, but a delight to thieves. I like to be ignorant of the count of what I have, so as to feel my loss less exactly. I ask those who live with me, if they lack affection for me and for honest dealings to cheat me and pay me with decent appearances, not having enough fortitude to endure the annoyance of the adverse accidents to which we are subject, and being unable to keep up the tension of regulating and ordering affairs, I foster as best I can this idea to abandon myself completely to fortune, accept the worst in everything, expect the worst in everything, and resolve to bear the, that worst meekly and patiently. It is for that alone that I labor. That is the goal toward which I direct all my reflections. When in danger, I do not think so much how I shall escape as 
how little it matters that I escaped. Even if I should fall, what would it matter? Not being able to rule events, I rule myself and adapt myself to them if they do not adapt themselves to me. I have hardly the skill to dodge fortune and escape her or force her, and to direct and lead things foresightly to serve my purpose. I have even less patience to stand the arduous and painful care that is needed for that, and the most painful situation for me is to be in suspense about urgent matters and toss between fear and hope deliberation even about the slightest things annoys me and i feel i feel my mind harder put to it to endure the various shocks and ups and downs of doubt and deliberation and to settle down and accept any course whatever after the die is cast few passions have troubled my sleep but as for deliberations the slightest one troubles it even as in roads i like to avoid the sloping and slippery sides and cast myself into the beaten part, even the muddiest and boggiest, from which I cannot sink lower and seek security there, just so I like pure misfortunes which do not try me and worry me any more once the uncertainty about mending them is over, and which drive me at a single bound directly into suffering. Uncertain ills torment us most. When things happen, I bear myself like a man and conducting them like a child. The dread of failing, falling gives me a greater fever than the fall. The game is not worth the candle. The miser is worse off for his passion than the poor man, and the jealous man than the cuckold. And often it is not as bad to lose your vineyard as to go to court for it. The lowest step is the firmest. It is the seat of constancy. There you need nothing but yourself. Constancy is founded there and leans only upon itself. Is there not a certain philosophical air about the case of a gentleman known to many? He married well long in years, having spent his youth in gay company, a great storyteller, a merry lad, remembering how the subject of cucklery had given him material for talking and jesting about others. To take cover, he married a woman whom he picked up in the place where each man can find one for his money, and made a compact with her that they would use these greetings. Good morning, horror. Good morning, cuckold. And there was nothing about which he talked more of often openly to visitors at his home than this arrangement of this by which he checked the secret gossip of mockers and blunted the point of this reproach. As for ambition, which is neighbor to presumption, or rather daughter, it would have been necessary to advance me for a fortune to come and take me by the hand. For as for taking pains for the sake of some uncertain hope and submitting to all the difficulties that attend those who try to push themselves into favor at the beginning of their career, I could never have done it. I do not purchase hope with ready cash. I cling to what I see and hold and do not go far from port. Let, un let one oar row in water, the other on the shore. And then man seldom arrives at these advancements except by first risking what he has, and it is my opinion that if what a man has is enough to maintain the way of life to which he has was born and brought up, it is folly to let go of it on the chance of increasing it. <clears throat> the man whom fortune denies a foothold and the means of arranging a calm and restful life is excusable if he tosses what he has the chance, since in any case necessity sends him questing. In evil we must take a risky path. And I sooner excuse a younger son for casting his inheritance to the winds than a man who has the honor of his house in his charge and cannot become needy without being at fault. I have certainly found the road shorter and easier with the advice of my good friends of past days by getting rid of this desire and keeping quiet. Who would enjoy the prize without the dust? Also judging very sanely that my powers were not capable of great things, remembering this saying of the late Chancellor Olivet, that the French are like monkeys who climb to the top of a tree from branch to branch and never stop moving until they have reached the highest branch and show their rear ends when they get there. It is shameful to take on a load that is too great, then leave it when a our knees buckle beneath its weight. Even the qualities that are not reproachable in me I have found useless in this age. My easy-going ways would have been called cowardice and weakness, fidelity and conscience, conscience, 
would have been thought squeamish and superstitious, frankness and independence, troublesome, thoughtless, and rash. Misfortune has its uses. It is good to be born in a very depraved time, for by comparison with others you are considered virtuous for a cheap price. Anyone who is only a parasite and sacrilegious in our days is a good and honorable man. If now a friend denies not what was given him in trust, if he restores an ancient purse with all its coins and rust, this prodigy of honesty deserves to be enrolled in Tuscan books and with the sacrificial lamb extolled. And there was never time and place where a sure and greater reward was offered to princes for goodness and justice. The first man who thinks to push himself into favor and credit by that path, I am much mistaken if he will not outstrip his fellows with much effort, without much effort. Force and violence can do something, but not always everything. We see merchants, village justices, and artisans keeping up with the nobility and valor and military knowledge. They do honorably in both private and public combats. They fight, they defend cities and our wars. A prince's distinction is smothered amid this crowd. Let him shine with humanity, truthfulness, loyalty, moderation, and especially justice, marks that are rare, unknown, and banished. It is only by the will of the people that he can do his job, and no other qualities can flatter their will as much as these, which are much more useful to them than the others. Nothing is so popular as goodness. By such a comparison, I would have thought myself great and rare, just as I think myself dwarfish and ordinary in comparison with certain past ages, in which it was a commonplace, if other, stronger qualities did not concur, to see a man moderate in his revenge, slow to resent offenses, religious in keeping his word, neither double-dealing nor shifty, nor accommodating his faith to the will of others or to the occasion, rather would I let affairs break their necks than twist my faith for the sake of them? For as for this newfangled virtue of hypocrisy and dissimulation, which is so highly honored at present, I mortally hate it, and of all vices I know none that testifies to so much cowardice and baseness of heart. It is a craven and servile idea to disguise ourselves and hide under a mask, and not to dare to show ourselves as we are. In that way are men trained for perfidy, being accustomed to speak false words. They have no scruples about breaking their word. A generous heart should not belie its thoughts. It wants to reveal itself even to its inmost depths. There, Everything is good, or at least everything is human. Aristotle considers it the function of magnanimity to hate and love openly, to judge, to speak with complete frankness, and to have no regard for the approbation or reprobation of others in comparison with truth. Apollonius said that it was for slaves to lie and for freemen to speak truth. Truth is the first and fundamental part of virtue. We must love it for itself. He who tells the truth because he has some external obligation to do so, and because it serves him, and who does not fear to tell a lie when it is not important to anybody, is not sufficiently truthful. My soul by nature shuns lying and hates even to think a lie. I feel an inward shame and a stinging remorse if one escapes me, as sometimes it does, for occasions surprise me and move me unpremeditatedly. We must not always say everything, for that would be folly, but what we say must be what we think, otherwise it is wickedness. I do not know what people expect to gain by incessant feigning and dissimulating, unless it is not to be believed even when they speak truth. That may deceive people once or twice, but to make a profession of covering up and to boast, as some of our princes have done, that they would throw their shirt in the fire if it were privy to their real intentions, which is the saying of the ancient Matillus of Macedon, and that a man who does not know how to dissemble does not know how to rule. This is warning those who have to deal with them that all they say is nothing but deceit and lies. The more artful and cunning a man is, the more he is hated and suspected when he loses his reputation for honesty. It would be very naive for a man to let himself be taken in by either the face or the words of one who takes pride in being always different outside and inside, as Tiberius did, and I do not know what part such people can have in human dealings since they never offer anything that is accepted as good money. 
He who is disloyal to truth is also disloyal to falsehood. <clears throat> Those who, in our time, in establishing the duties of a prince, have considered only the good of his affairs, and have preferred that to caring for his fidelity and conscience, would have something to say to a prince whose affairs fortune had so arranged that he could establish them once and for all by a single breach and betrayal of his word. But that is not the way it goes. You often fall into the same sort of bargain again. You make more than one peace, more than one treaty in your life. The gain that lures them to the first breach of faith, and always, almost always there is gain in it, as in all other wicked deeds, sacrilege, murder, rebellion, treachery, are always undertaken for some sort of profit. This first gain brings after it endless losses, casting this prince out of all relations and means of negotiation in consequence of his breach of faith. When, during my childhood, Solomon, of the Ottoman race, a race not overly careful about observing promises and pact, landed his army at Otranto, he learned that Macurino de Gratanare and the inhabitants of the Castro were held prisoners after having surrendered the place, contrary to the terms of capitulation, and sent word that they should be released, and he said that having other great enterprises at hand in the region, such a breath of faith, although seemed, it seems somewhat useful at present, would bring upon him in the future a bad name and distrust, and a distrust infinitely harmful. Now, for my part, I would rather be troublesome and indiscreet than flattering and dissembling. I admit that a touch of pride and stubbornness may enter into keeping me sincere and outspoken without consideration for others, and it seems to me that I restrain myself a little less whenever it would be a appropriate to re restrain myself more, and that I react against the respect I owe by growing more heated. It may be, too, that I let myself follow my nature for lack of art, when I display to great men the same extreme freedom of tongue and bearing that I exercise in my own house. I feel how much it inclines towards indiscretion and incivility, but besides the fact that I am made that way, I have not a supple enough mind to sidestep a sudden question and escape it by some dodge or to invent a truth or a good enough memory to retain something thus invented and certainly not enough assurance to maintain it and and I put on a bold face because of weakness therefore I give myself up to being candid and always saying what I think by inclination and re by reason leaving it to fortune to guide the outcome Aristippus said that the chief fruit he had gathered from philosophy was that he spoke freely and openly to everyone. Memory is a wonderfully useful tool, and without it judgment does its work with difficulty. It is entirely lacking in me. What anyone wants to propound to me must be propounded piecemeal, for to answer a discourse in which there are several different headings is not in my power. I cannot receive a commission without my writing tablets, and when I have a speech of consequence to make, it, if it is of some weight, I am reduced to the mean and miserable necessity of learning it by heart, word for word, what I have to say. Otherwise, I would have neither manner nor assurance, being in fear that my memory would play me a bad trick. But this way is no less difficult for me. To learn three lines of poetry, I need three hours. And then, in a work of my own, the freedom <clears throat> and authority to change the order and alter a word every very ever varying the material makes it harder to keep in mind. Now, the more I distrust my memory, the more confused it becomes. It serves me better by chance encounter. I have to solicit it nonchalantly, for if I press it, it is stunned, and once it has begun to totter, the more I probe it, the more it gets mixed up and embarrassed. It serves me at its own time, not at mine. This thing that I feel in my memory, I feel in several other parts. I flee command, obligation, and constraint. What I do easily and naturally, I can no longer do if I order myself to do it by strict and express command. Even as regards my body, the parts that have some particular freedom and jurisdiction over themselves sometimes refuse to obey me when I destine and bind them to a certain time and place for compulsory service. These forced and tyrannical advance orders repel them. They go limp from fear or spite and become paralyzed. Some time ago, being in a place where it is a barbarous discourtesy not to respond to those who invite you to drink, though I was treated with complete freedom, I tried to play the good fellow for the sake of the ladies who were in the party according to the custom of the country, but then the fun began, 
for the threat and anticipation of having to force myself beyond my natural habit stopped up my gullet so that I could not swallow a single drop and was deprived of drink even as much as my meal required. I found myself brimful and my thirst quenched by all the drink that my imagination had anticipated. This effect is more apparent in those who have a more ardent and powerful imagination, but for all that, it is natural and there is no one who does not feel it somewhat. An excellent archer, condemned to death, was offered his life if he would show some notable proof of his skill. He refused to try it, fearing that the excessive tension of his will would make his hand go astray, and that instead of saving his life he would lose the reputation he had acquired for shooting with the bow. A man whose thoughts are elsewhere will not fail to the inch to take always the same number and length of steps in the place where he walks, but if he goes at it attentively, measuring and counting them, he will find that what he did naturally and by chance he will not do so not do as exactly by design. <clears throat> my library, which is a handsome one among country libraries, is situated at one corner of my house. If anything enters my fancy that I want to look up or write down there, for fear it may escape me, even as I cross my courtyard, I have to give it into someone else's safekeeping. If in speaking I am emboldened to digress, however, little from my thread, I never fail to lose it, which is the reason I keep myself constrained, dry, and compressed in speaking. People who serve me I have to call by the name of their job or of the province, for it is very hard for me to remember names. To be sure, I will tell you that it has three syllables and a rough sound, that it begins or ends with such and such a letter, and if I were to live a long time, I do not doubt that I would forget my own name, as others have done. Masala Corvinus was two years without any trace of memory, and this is also said of George of Tresb Trebizond. and in my own interest I often ruminate about what sort of a life theirs was, and with, whether without this faculty I shall have enough left to support me with any comfort, and looking at it closely I fear that this defect if it is absolute, ruins all the functions of the mind. It is certain that the memory is the only receptacle, not only of philosophy, but of all that concerns the conduct of life, and of all the arts. I am full of cracks and leak, and leak out on all sides. It has happened more than once that I have forgotten the watchword that I have, that I had given three hours before, or received from another and forgotten where I had hidden my purse in spite of what Cicero says about that. I help myself to lose what I lock up most carefully. Memory is the receptacle and container of knowledge. Mine being so defective, I can hardly complain if I do not know much. I know in general the names of the arts and what they treat, but nothing beyond that. I leaf through books, I do not study them. What I retain of them is something I no longer recognize as anyone else's. It is only the material from which my judgment has profited, and the thoughts and ideas with which it has become imbued, the author, the place, the words, and other circumstances I immediately forgot. And I am so good at forgetting that I forget even my own writings and compositions no less than the rest. People are all the time quoting me to myself without my knowing it. Anyone who would like to know the sources of the verses and examples I have piled up here will put me to great trouble to tell them and yet I have begged them only at well-known and famous stores, not content with their being rich unless they also came from rich and honorable hands, and then authority and reason concur. It is no great wonder if my book follows the fate of other books, and if my memory lets go of what I write as of what I read, and of what I give as of what I receive. Besides the defect of my memory, I have others which contribute greatly to my ignorance, my mind is slow and dull, it cannot penetrate the slightest cloud, so that, for example, I could never offer it any enigma, enigma, <clears throat> enigma easy enough for it to unravel. There is no subtlety so empty that it will not stump me. Of games in which the mind has a part, chess, cards, draughts, and others, I understand nothing but the barest rudiments. My apprehension is slow and muddled. But what it once grasps, it grasps well and embraces most entirely, closely, and deeply for such a time as it does grasp it. My sight is long, sound, and whole, but it is easily tired by work and grows blurred. 
for that reason I cannot have long sessions with books except by the help of others. The younger Pliny will inform those who have not experienced it how important this delay is to those who devote themselves to this occupation. There is no mind so puny or brutish as not to reveal some particular faculty shining out. There is none so buried but that some bit of it will burst forth. And how it happens that a mind that is blind and asleep to everything else is lively, clear, and excellent in some particular task, you must inquire of the masters. But the fine minds are the universal minds, open and ready for everything, if not well taught, at least teachable. And I say this to accuse my own, for whether by weakness or nonchalance, and to be nonchalant about what lies at our feet, what we have between our hands, what most concerns our use of life, is something far removed from my doctrine. There is no mind as inept as mine, and none as ignorant of many such ordinary common things uh, of which a man cannot be ignorant without disgrace. I must cite a few examples. I was born and brought up in the country and in the midst of farming. I have had affairs and management in my hands ever since my predecessors in the possession of the property I enjoy left their place. Now I cannot reckon either with counters or with a pen. Most of our coins I do not know, nor do I know the difference between one grain and another, either in the ground or in the barn, unless it is too obvious. And I can scarcely distinguish the difference between the cabbages and lettuces in my garden. I do not even understand the names of the chief household implements or the roughest principles of agriculture which children know. I know still less of the mechanical arts of trade and merchandise, of the diversity and nature of fruits, wines, and foods, and of how to train a bird or a doctor or a horse or a dog. And since I must make my shame quite complete, not a month ago I was caught ignorant of the leaven that leaven was used to make bread and what was meant by fermenting wine. Once in Athens, people conjectured an aptitude for mathematics in a man who was seen ingeniously arranging a load of brushwood and making it into faggots. Truly, they would draw the very opposite conclusion about me, for if you give me all the equipment of a kitchen, I will starve. From these lines of my confession, you can imagine others at my expense. But whatever I make myself known to be, provided I make myself known such as I am, I am carrying out my plan. And so I make no excuse for daring to put into writing such mean and trivial remarks as these. The meanness of my subject forces me to do so. Blame my project, if you will, but not my procedure. At all events, I see well enough, without others telling me how little value and weight all this has, and the folly of my plan. It is enough that my judgment is not unshod, of which these are the essays. Be nosy as you will, have such a nose, the atlas to support it would refuse, the tennis self bewilder with your wit, against my trifles you can say no wit more than I've said myself, why use your teeth on teeth, if you'd be full you must have meat, save up your pains, your sting, for those who so admire themselves, that this is not we know. I am not obligated not to say stupid things, provided I do not fool myself and that I recognize them as such, and to slip up knowingly is so common for me that I scarcely ever slip up any other way, I never slip up accidentally. It is a small matter to attribute my silly actions to the rashness of my disposition, since I cannot help commonly attributing my vicious actions to it. One day at Barleduc, I saw King Francis II presented in remembrance of René, King of Sicily, with a portrait that this king had made of himself. Why is it not permissible in the same way for each man to portray himself with the pen as he portrayed himself with a pencil? So I do not want to forget this further scar, very unfit to produce in public irresolution, a most harmful failing in negotiating worldly affairs. I do not know which side to take in doubtful enterprises, nor yes nor no, my inmost heart will say. I can easily maintain an opinion, but not choose one, because in human matters, whatever side we lean to, we find many probabilities to confirm us in it, and the philosopher Chrysippus said that he wanted to learn from Zeno and Cleanthes, his masters, nothing but their tenets. For when it came to proofs and reasons, he would furnish enough by himself. 
So in whatever direction I turn, I can always provide myself with enough causes and probabilities to keep me that way. So I keep within me doubt and freedom of choice until the occasion is urgent. And then, to confess the truth, I most often toss the feather to the wind, as they say, and abandon myself to the mercy of fortune. Very slight inclination and circumstance carries me away. When the mind doubts, a trifle pulls it to and fro. The uncertainty of my judgment is so evenly balanced in most occurrences that I would willingly submit to the decision of chance and of the dice. And I note, with much reflection, on our human weakness, the examples that even sacred history has left us of this custom of entrusting to fortune and chance, the determination of choice in doubtful cases, the lot fell upon Matthias. X. Human reason is two-edged and dangerous sword, and even in the hands of Socrates, its most intimate and familiar friends see what a many-ended stick it is. Thus I am fit only to follow, and I let myself be carried away easily by the crowd. I do not trust my own powers enough to undertake to command or to guide. I am very glad to find my steps traced out by others. If I must run the risk of an uncertain choice, I would rather it should be under some man who is more sure of his opinions and wedded to them than I am to mine, whose foundation and grounds I find slippery. And yet I am not too easy to change, since I perceive a like weakness in contrary opinions. The very habit of assenting seems to be dangerous and slippery. Notably, in political matters there is a fine field open for vacillation and dispute, as when an even scale with equal weights is pressed, neither side rises, neither falls, it stays at rest. Machiavelli's arguments, for example, were solid enough for the subject, yet it was very easy to combat them, and those who did so left it no less easy to combat theirs. In such an argument, there would always be matter for answers, rejoinders, replications, triplications, quadruplications, and that infinite web of disputes that pettifoggers have spun out as far as they could in favor of lawsuits. We are hard hit and hit out hard in turn. For the reasons have little other foundation than experience, and the diversity of human events offers us infinite examples in all sorts of forms. A learned person of our time says that when there, when where they say warm in our almanacs, if someone wants to say cold and wet where they say dry, and always put down the opposite of what they forecast, and if he had to lay a wager on one or the other coming true, he would not care which side he took, except in cases that admit of no uncertainty, such as promising extreme heat at Christmas and the rigors of winter on Midsummer's Day. I have the same opinion about these political arguments. Whatever part they give you to play, you have as good a chance as your opponent, provided you do not bump up against his principles that are too plain and obvious. And therefore, to my mind, in public affairs, there is no course so bad, provided it is old and stable, that it is not better than change and commotion. Our morals are extremely corrupt and lean with a remarkable inclination toward the worse <clears throat> of our laws and customs. Many are barbarous and monstrous. However, because of the difficulty of improving our condition and the danger of everything crumbling into bits, if I could put a stroke in our wheel and stop it at this point, I would do so with all my heart. Never such a shameful fault Foul examples do we find, but that still worse untold remain behind. The worst thing I find in our state is instability, and the fact that our laws cannot any more than our clothes take any settled form. It is very easy to accuse a government of imperfection, for all mortal things are full of it. It is very easy to engender in people contempt for their ancient observances, never to man undertake that without succeeding. But as for establishing a better state in place of the one they have ruined, Many of those who have attempted it have achieved nothing for their pains. I give my prudence small share in my conduct. I readily let myself be led by the general way of the world. Happy the people who do what they are commanded better than those who command. Without tormenting themselves about the reasons who let themselves roll relaxedly with the rolling of the heavens. Obedience is not pure or tranquil in a man who reasons and argues. 
all in all, to return to myself, the only thing that makes me think something of myself is the thing in which no man ever thought himself deficient. My recommendation is vulgar, common, and popular, for who ever thought he lacked sense? That would be a proposition implying its own contradiction. It is a disease that is never where it is perceived. It is indeed tenacious and strong, but it is pierced and dispersed by the first glance from the patient's eye, like a dense fog by a glance from the sun. To accuse oneself would be to excuse oneself in that subject, and to condemn oneself would be to absolve oneself. There never was a porter or a silly woman who did not think they had enough sense to take care of themselves. We readily acknowledge in others an advantage in courage, in bodily strength, in experience, in agility, in beauty, but an advantage in judgment we yield to no one, and the arguments that come from simple, natural reasoning in others we think we would have found if we had merely glanced in that direction. As for knowledge, style, and such qualities that we see in the works of others, we sense very easily whether they surpass our own. But as for the simple products of the understanding, each man thinks he had it in him to hit upon the very same things, and does not easily perceive their weight and difficulty, unless, and hardly even then, they are at a great distance and beyond comparison. So this is a kind of exercise for which I must hope for very little commendation and praise, and a kind of composition offering little renown. And then, of for whom do you write? The learned men to whom it falls to pass judgment on books know no other value than that of learning, and admit no other procedure for our minds than that of erudition and art. If you have mistaken one of the Scipios for the other, what is there left for you to say that can be worthwhile. Anyone who does not know Aristotle, according to them, by the same token, does not know himself. Common ordinary minds do not see the grace and the weight of a lofty and subtle speech. Now these two types fill the world. The third class, into whose hands you come, that of minds regulated and strong in themselves, is so rare that, for this very reason, it has neither name nor rank among us. It is time half-wasted to aspire and strive to please this group. It is commonly said that the fairest division of her favors nature has given us is that of sense, for there is no one who is not content with the share of it that she has allotted him. Is that not reasonable? If anyone saw beyond, he would see beyond his sight. I think my opinions are good and sound, but who does not think as much of his? One of the best proofs I have of mine is the little esteem I have for myself, for if these opinions had not been very firm, they would easily have let themselves be fooled by the singular affection I have for myself. Being one who concentrates nearly all his affection upon himself and does not squander much of it elsewhere, all the affection that others distribute to an infinite multitude of friends and acquaintances, to their glory, to their greatness, I devote entirely to the repose of my mind and to myself. What escapes in other directions is not properly by command of my reason. Trained to live healthily and for myself. Now I find my opinions infinitely bold and constant in condemning my inadequacy. In truth, this too is a subject on which I exercise my judgment as much as on any other. The world always looks straight ahead. As for me, I turn my gaze inward. I fix it there and keep it busy. Everyone looks in front of him. As for me, I look inside of me. I have no business but with myself, I continually observe myself, I take stock of myself, I taste myself. Others always go elsewhere. If they stop to think about it, they always go forward. No man tries to descend into himself. As for me, I roll about in myself. This capacity for sifting th truth, whatever it may amount to in me, and this free will not to enslave my belief easily, I owe principally to myself. For the firmest and most general ideas I have are those which, in a manner of speaking, were born with me. They are natural and all mine. I produce them crude and simple, with a conception bold and strong, but a little confused and imperfect. Since then I have established and fortified them by the authority of others and the sound arguments of the ancients, with whom I found my judgment in agreement. These men have given me a firmer grip on my ideas and a more complete enjoyment and possession of them. 
the recommendation everyone seeks for liveliness and promptness of wit I aspire to for orderliness, what they seek for a brilliant and signal deed, or for some particular ability, I aspire to for order, consistency, and tranquility of opinions and conduct. Generally, if anything is becoming, it is the uniformity in our whole lives and in our individual actions which you cannot maintain if, imitating the nature of others, you eliminate your own. Here, then, you see to what extent I feel guilty of what I said was the first part of the vice of presumption. As for the second, which consists in not esteeming others highly enough, I do not know if I can excuse myself so well, for cost me what it may, I am determined to tell the facts about it. Whether it may be that the continual association I have with the humors of the ancients, and the idea I have formed of those rich souls of the past, give me a distaste both for others and for myself, or whether we are indeed living in a time which produces only very mediocre things, at any rate, I know of nothing worthy of great admiration. Also, I know scarcely any men intimately enough to be able to judge them, and those I come in contact with most commonly through my situation are, for the most part, men who have little care for the culture of the soul, and to whom one can suggest no other blessing than honor, and no other perfection than valor. What beauty I see in others I praise and esteem very gladly. Indeed, I often go farther than what I really think of it, and allow myself to lie to that extent, for I am incapable of inventing anything false. I am glad to testify for my friends to the praiseworthy qualities I find in them, and of one foot of value I am likely to make a foot and a half, but as for lending them qualities that are not there, I cannot, nor can I defend them openly for the imperfections they have. Even to my enemies I frankly render the testimony of honor that is due. My feelings change, my judgment no, and I do not confuse my criticism with other, consider other circumstances that do not enter into it, and I am so jealous of the liberty of my judgment that I can hardly give it up for any passion whatsoever. I do, not, I do myself more harm by lying than I do to the person I lie about. This laudable and generous custom is observed of the Persian nation, that they speak of their mortal enemies and wage war to the death against them honorably and fairly, so far as their valor deserves it. <clears throat> I know enough men who have various fine qualities, one wit, another courage, another another oh sorry another skill, another conscience, another style, one of science, another another. But as for an all around great man, having all these fine parts together, or one part in such excellent degree as to cause amazement or comparison with the men of the past whom we honor, I have not had the good fortune to find any. And the greatest man I have known in person I mean for natural qualities of the soul and the best endowed was Etienne de la Boisie. He was truly a full soul, handsome from every point of view of soul of the old stamp, who would have achieved great results if fortune had willed it, for he had added much to this rich nature by learning and study. But I do not know how it happens, and yet beyond doubt it does happen, that there is much as much vanity and weakness of understanding in those who profess to have the greatest capacity and who meddle with literary occupations and tasks that depend on books as in any sort of other sort of men, whether because people demand and expect more of them and cannot excuse ordinary faults in them, or because the thought that they are learned emboldens them to show off and reveal too much of themselves, whereby they ruin and betray themselves, just as an artisan shows his stupidity much better on some rich material he has in his hands, if he arranges and mixes it foolishly and contrary to the rules of his craft, than on some wretched stuff, and as people are more offended at a defect in a statue of gold than in one that is of plaster, so do these men, when they display things that in themselves and in their place would be good, for they use them without discretion, doing honor to their memory at the expense of their intelligence. They do honor to Cicero, Galen, Ulpian, and St. Jerome, and themselves they make ridiculous. I gladly return to the subject of the ineptitude of our education. Its goal has been to make us not good or wise, but learned. It has attained this goal. It has not taught us to follow and embrace virtue and wisdom, but has imprinted in us their derivation, derivation and etymology. We know how to decline virtue if we cannot love it, if we do not 
know what wisdom is by practice and experience. We know it by jargon and by rote. With our neighbors, we are not content to know their family, their kindred, and their connections. We want to have them as friends and form some association, understanding with them. Education has taught us the definitions, divisions, and partitions of virtue, like the surnames and branches of genealogy, without any further concern to form between us and virtue any familiar relationship and intimate acquaintance. It has chosen for our instruction not the books that have the soundest and truest opinions, but those that speak the best Greek and Latin, and amid its beautiful words it has poured into our minds the most inane humors of antiquity. A good education changes your judgment and conduct, as happened to Polemon, that dissipated young Greek who, having gone by chance to hear a lecture by Xenocrates, did not notice merely the eloquence and mastery of the teacher, or bring back to his house merely the knowledge of some fine matter, but reaped a more perceptible and solid fruit, which ha was the sudden change and amendment of his former life, who has ever felt such an effect from our education. Will you behave like Polemon when he reformed one bygone day? Will you lay down the badges of disease, wraps, anklets, pads, as he tore from his drunken neck, they say, the wreath of glee, when the undinnered sage addressed him chidingly. The least contemptible class of people seems to me to be those who, through their simplicity, occupy the lowest rank, and they seem to show greater regularity in their actions. The morals and talk of peasants I find commonly more obedient to the prescriptions of true philosophy than are those of our philosophers. The common people are wiser because they are as wise as they need be. The most notable men that I have judged by outward appearances, for to judge them in my own way, I would need more light on them, were, in point of war and military ability, the Duke of Guise, who died at Orleans, and the late Marshal Strozzi, as for able men of uncommon virtue, Olivier, Olivier and Le Hapital, chancellors of France, it seems to me that poetry, too, has flourished in our century, we have a wealth of good craftsmen in that trade. Durat's, Beza, Buchanan, Buchanan Hapital, Mont Doré, Turnibus. As for those writing in French, I think they have raised its poetry to the highest point it will ever reach, and in respects in which Ronsard and Du Bellay excel, I do not consider them far removed from the perfection of the ancients. Adri Adrianus, Turnibus knew more and knew better what he knew than any man that lived in his time or for many years before. The lives of the Duke of Alva, who died recently, and of our Constable de Montmorency were notable, noble lives that had many rare similarities in fortune. But the beauty and glory of the latter's death, suddenly and in extreme old age, before the eyes of Paris and his king, and in their service against his nearest kin commanding an army victorious through his leadership deserves i think to be placed among the notable events of my time so do the constant goodness blah 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 <clears throat> there's a the rest of the essay is actually kind of added in by somebody that worked for him so i'm not going to read that <clears throat>